You are Asian. That's a very hard handicap to overcome. Don't forget her advantage is being Asian. You were rejected because you're Asian. We're the Asians in college admissions. Regardless of the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action, a lot of people will be upset. So no matter who you are, please hear me out today because the conclusion might surprise you. Ever since my Stanford rejection video blew up, I've been in the rabbit hole researching college admissions history, the statistics, why people are commenting these things. I even interviewed many of my friends from various backgrounds, including African American. I found that a key point of division that people may feel when discussing race and college admissions is that we don't really understand each side's perspective and story. We are individuals and policies or lack thereof affect different people differently. To be more considerate and just kinder as a society, we should understand who we're talking about. In the first part of the video, let's put away all politics, forget what they are, let's just be open-hearted and learn about the Asian American story. We'll talk specifics about Asians' treatment in the US, and then we'll talk about whether affirmative action is harmful to Asians. Lastly, are there solutions? The Asian American Story my parents came to the US in the 1990s with $1,000 between the two of them. That's $1,000 plus two $1,000 plane tickets for a total of $3,000 borrowed from my grandparents. That $3,000 was over 20 years of savings, but they were happy to give it to my parents because they wanted every generation to be stronger than the last. Once they got here, it was rough because they didn't understand the culture and barely knew the language. While my dad did his postdoc, my mom struggled to find a job, so she ended up working in a factory and specifically took the night shifts from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. because you can earn 50 more cents per hour. Five years later, my parents went into industry and had me and my sister. My very first memory of learning was when my mom was in the shower and I was standing outside around four years old yelling the multiplication tables. I was reciting them to her. And learning before elementary school really set a strong foundation. At the start, I didn't even know that races were a thing. I just thought everyone in my class was the same. It was only until kids started doing this gesture with their eyes that I got really confused and I started to realize that maybe we're different. There's also the classic lunchbox story, which I won't repeat here. To say the least, I also got made fun of for the clothes I would wear. Middle school is when I discovered the Asian stereotypes. I heard, oh yeah, he's Asian, so he must be really smart. And, oh yeah, she's pretty smart, but not for an Asian. This is called the model minority myth, and I recently learned that it's actually extremely damaging to kids' mental health and their ability to get the academic support they need. In sixth grade, I struggled a lot with Algebra 1, much more so than my classmates, and I felt like there was something wrong with me because Asian kids are supposed to be good at math, right? Luckily, my dad was super patient and would do extra problems with me every day after school until I eventually became the best in class. And that made me really excited because it was amazing to work so hard for something and have it pay off. I felt a sense of security and pride in being known as smart, and I felt like I could maintain that title too as long as I worked hard. But that also put a lot of pressure on me, not to mention that at the dinner table, my parents would always remind my sister and me how lucky we were. When I was your age, my sister and I would be like, here we go again. <laughs> but I mean, it's true, we were lucky. They only got new clothes once a year and they could only eat meat twice a year. I learned to be extremely frugal and grateful for the life that my parents gave us. So I worked even harder because I wanted the time and effort that they put into us and the sacrifices they made to pay off. So late middle school and high school was especially grind time. I took after school math lessons for two hours per week. For that, we had three hours of additional homework. I did summer math camps where we had eight plus hours of math every day for six weeks. I played piano, club basketball, and I volunteered at the hospital. Social events took a back seat. It was obvious that my friends were going to more football games and going to the mall more than me. It was hard though, because to handle all that I put on myself, even when I was waiting for things like my tennis match to start, the other kids would be socializing, playing around, and I'd be reading my textbook. Throughout all of this, I would be extremely embarrassed if someone asked me what I do on my Sundays or what I do outside of school, because I'd hate saying the words Chinese school, and I don't want to say that my outside activity is math, like more math. <laughs> Overall, there's still this very implicit feeling that I didn't belong 
long because I couldn't just say who I was, what I was doing, even if I genuinely did like math. And especially when I was on the basketball and volleyball teams, I honestly felt pretty ostracized by most of my teammates. I love and appreciate my parents a lot. They took me to piano classes, they practiced basketball with me, and they taught me more math on the weekends. But college prep was a big struggle because they never filled out the common application, English wasn't even their first language, and they didn't even know what colleges were looking for. They just didn't really have the means to help me, especially because I'm the oldest kid. They only knew that we had to get top ACT and SAT scores. With being frugal, I purely used free resources like Khan Academy to prep. Also, as a part of being frugal, that meant hiring someone to help with admissions or to read my essay was not even in consideration. Honestly, I don't think we even knew that we could hire someone to help me with that. Again, that meant using free things as much as possible. I attended tons and tons of free webinars and filled pages with notes from them, just trying to wrap my head around all this information about, oh, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, this is how you should stand out on your essay. When it came time to fill out the application, I was procrastinating on one spot, the race part. I was scared to put Asian. Honestly, I didn't really understand all the things that go behind the policies and stuff back then. I just knew I was scared to put Asian because it would be harder for me. So one night at the dinner table, I triumphantly told my parents that I'm not gonna put Asian. And they said, Amy, your last name gives it away anyway. And I was like, oh. Darn. <laughs> so they said, it's okay. You tried your best. That's all you can do. And these were my stats, by the way. When decisions came along, I was pretty crushed. I did not get into my dream school, Stanford, nor any Ivy Leagues. I really didn't think of race as a factor. I was just extremely disappointed in my results and myself. And I thought that I did something wrong, which like I said in my Stanford video, I think I did. Things ended up working out still because I loved Caltech. Since graduating, I've done a lot of reflection and I realized that it's not just because of my hard work. My parents dedicated like all their waking hours to us. They almost never watch TV, they didn't go out to do their own events. The only events they went to were my basketball games, my sister's volleyball games, our events. My dad attended 99% of all those math sessions with me and he spent his work hours at the office studying competition math so he could help me. My mom would rush home from work almost every day to cook for us from scratch just so we could be healthier. And most of all, they worked so hard just to come to the US to build a better life for my sister and me and to stay here even though they didn't feel like they belonged. As much as they tried, they couldn't socialize with other people very well. And their kids are from a whole nother world. English is our first language. We're more Americanized they had to sacrifice that not only generational difference, but that cultural difference also made it a struggle for their kids, you know, to sometimes butt heads a lot with them. Things can be hard when you have immigrant parents because you don't have the connections that other kids might have and they don't have that experience in school in the US that you can learn from. But honestly, my parents did everything they could for us and even the stress that they put on us was all out of love. I was talking with my dad about this the other day, just thanking him and he said, we just do our best and be dedicated. Dedication makes you do things well. And he, like my grandma says, we hope every generation is stronger than the previous. That's why they came to America, the land of dreams. By definition, the American dream is the ideal by which a quality of opportunity is available to any American, allowing the highest aspirations and goals to be achieved. So what is it like for Asians in America? Asians in the US. So there's a lot that I could go over, but I'm just gonna mention three things right now to set the context. According to a 2023 survey, the Asian American community feels the least sense of belonging compared to any other group in the US. A reason is said to be the fear of violence, given the attacks that were made on their elderly and other members of their community during the pandemic. And then he lifted me up, slammed me to the ground. Lance could also be heard yelling racial slurs at him. Those words, he says, hurt more than the physical pain. I cannot change my face to be look like an American. What other ethnic group has had their elderly attacked like this? The community doesn't see themselves in positions of authority across the US and report experiencing discrimination. Speaking of discrimination, Asian students must on average score 140 points higher on the SAT than white applicants to stand the same chance of admissions. This is called the Asian tax. After 10 years of hard work, you're gonna tax them based on knowing what race they are. Does this make it seem like working hard is less meaningful? And this reminds me of actually when I was in high school and I got my results, someone said, as I heard from a friend, what's the point of working so much harder than everyone else? 
In the end, she didn't even get into an Ivy League. Don't worry, cause there's a fix though. Just pretend like you're not Asian. But God forbid you actually like chess or tennis or math like any other Asian. The third thing is that Asians still suffer from the model minority myth. This stereotypes all Asian Americans as intelligent, hardworking, and therefore more successful than other minorities. However, some Southeast Asian ethnicities have higher high school dropout rates and lower socioeconomic backgrounds. I am a private tutor for students of various backgrounds, and I can tell you that Asians are not naturally smarter. Stereotypes, as you saw in my story, affected me too, but at least I could get good scores. What about the kid who's so amazing at art, but then they're feeling like they fall short every day because they struggle more in math? With a combination of those three things I just mentioned, it's like Asians are expected to excel in academics, but then because of that expectation, and when we try to meet those expectations, we suddenly have an advantage to correct for. By glorifying Asian success, society denies that discrimination exists and ignores the sacrifices that Asians have had to make in order to succeed. Several pieces of psychology research show that fear of self-identifying as Asian can affect one's identity development and mental health. Denial of Asian heritage can lead to intergenerational conflict and moreover, anxiety and depression. America is a melting pot and it's beautiful because we have all these diverse heritages and backgrounds, but some Asian kids might not even want to to identify with their heritage. One potential cause is affirmative action. Affirmative action upsets people way more than things like legacy. Why? After all, both make being Asian a disadvantage. First off, if someone is given a disadvantage due to something they can't control, I think the vast majority of people wouldn't like that, regardless of the cause, which could be for affirmative action, your race, and for a legacy, your wealth, and family background. We teach our children to love everyone equally. Subconscious bias is normal, it's part of being human. So we can't necessarily tell colleges not to have biases either, but society has been moving in the direction of not letting the color of our skin be a source of that bias. And I think that's why people are generally more hung up about affirmative action. Legacy admits increase the chances that their alumni will donate back to the school and the schools need money to operate and to give scholarships. Think about it. If I was a Harvard alum and my grandfather and my father were also Harvard alums, then yeah, I'd feel a ton of pride in that legacy <laughs> and donate back to the school too. So colleges make this decision because of those monetary benefits that come from monetary and and legacy differences. The contrast with affirmative action is that it's race-based. Because we want to teach our kids to be more accepting and embrace our differences, it strikes a much more negative chord that these higher education institutions are making decisions based on race. Grouping by race, like the model minority myth, erases the individual. The individual who could have come from a very difficult socioeconomic background, but who is penalized for the color of their skin. Asians fighting for fair admissions is not fighting against another group's fairness. It's not that they're trying to bring someone else down. The cause doesn't matter to them. They just don't want to be penalized anymore. I believe in everyone's potential and believe more people should have the opportunity to realize that potential. That's why, for example, I make YouTube videos to help students. Underprivileged groups should definitely get support, but should it be at the expense of another group? We're together, all minorities. Asians have nothing against someone getting a higher education. It's just that no one likes it when it harms them, especially given all of their hard work and efforts. We need mutual understanding between between everyone. But on the flip side, is affirmative action really the issue here? When it was enacted as part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the goal was to help all races gain admissions where higher education was predominantly white. So it's actually helpful for Asians, African Americans, women, etc. to all get a slice of the fixed pie. Without affirmative action, what will be the reality? What will the demographics look like? With legacy still being there because that's not based on race, will there be overwhelmingly more well-off wealthy students? In fact, historically, white students were upset at Asians for taking their spots. Maybe we should use socioeconomic status. I hear this a lot and I agree. It sounds excellent in theory. But then we're just reminded that colleges are businesses and they want students who can donate back. And that's why even though they're trying to increase diversity and help underprivileged minorities, the vast majority of admits is still from the top 20% of the income distribution. So maybe the issue isn't affirmative action, but it's that it allows race to be seen in admissions and there's anti-Asian bias. Harvard rated Asian Americans on personality, right? On subjective factors like likability and courage lower. When 
comparing applicants with the same level of academic achievement, Asians always had the worst personality scores of any group. So either Asian Americans really have worse personalities or the university is biased against them. But interviewers actually gave them personal ratings comparable to those of whites. This bias might relate to those internet comments where people say, we only do something because we're Asian. We only get this because we're Asian. Or we just don't have a personality. So what's the problem here? Is it that while education is supposed to be this unbiased, golden concept trying to better our society, money is still interfering too much? Or is it that there's anti-Asian bias, which materializes when races are known? I won't get into the weeds too much because the research discussion could go on forever, so I'll just ask you, what is the solution? It's very complex, so i love to hear your ideas in the comments, but what I will say is this. Asians being discriminated against is a real issue. What that is caused by, I cannot say, as explained earlier, but improvement can start with college admissions because the statistics, what Harvard admits, the hearings, they don't lie. We're called smart, we're called nerds, we're called the model minority, and then we're disadvantaged for meeting those expectations and excelling in school. Racial biases are a real problem, and I know we're trying to move in the progressive direction, but that starts with being open-minded toward every perspective. We should consider every individual as deserving of inclusion. This video spreading awareness is for the Asian kid struggling in math, but then being told, aren't your people good at math? True story. It's for the hopeful Asian kid who came from a low socioeconomic background. And yes, finally, it's for my future kids because I don't want them to be harmed by those biases. It's every group that should feel more heard, more seen, more welcome. We need more empathy and caring about each other as equals. Fate just places us in different bodies, different backgrounds. The only way to improve our society is by working together and unifying as a society. That's the common goal. We're all human. We're all American.